at the end of the seventh century in Jerusalem, the people are sinning. Jeremiah, who's the prophet at the time, is desperate to get everybody to repent. And what does he pull out of his bag to show them the importance of what he's saying and the seriousness of the fact that the first Beit Hamikdash might very well be destroyed if they don't start behaving properly. This is what he says to the people, and I'm reading here from Jeremiah 26, verse 4. Say to them, thus says the Lord, if you do not obey me, abiding by the teaching I've set before you, heeding the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I've been sending to persistently, but you have not heeded, then I will make this house like Shiloh, and I will make the city a curse for all nations of earth. The priests and prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. We're talking about the first temple. And when Jeremiah finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him shouting, you shall die. How dare you prophesy in the name of the Lord that this house shall become like Shiloh and the city be made desolate without inhabitants. Everybody knows the story of Shiloh. What's the story of Shiloh? Well, this is where we are today. I have brought you to the ancient town of Shiloh. Shiloh is the first place that we have a religious center in the land of Israel when we come in with Joshua. The, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, that has been wandering around the desert with the people for 40 years is brought into the land. Joshua comes here with the people, and it is here in Shiloh where he divides up the Nachalot, the inheritance for all the different tribes, all the different tribal lots. And it is here that the Mishkan is put, and this is the religious center, the ritual center for the nation for the entire period of the judges. Before Jerusalem, Jerusalem is still being controlled by the Jebusites. Nobody knows of Jerusalem. It's not even part of where the Jews are living yet. And Shiloh is the place. At that time, Shiloh is Hamakom. So what happens here? Why is it this used as a threat by Jeremiah in order to get the people to repent? So at the very end, in the book of Samuel, we're talking about Samuel 1, chapter 4, Shiloh is destroyed. The Jews are, it's not even so much that the Jews are sinning. What we believe is that the priests are sinning. The, the priests who are the Kohanim, who are taking care of the Mishkan, where the people are coming on the festivals, on the pilgrimages, are not behaving nicely to the people, especially not nicely to the women. And therefore, the plishtim, the Jews take Eli as the Kohen, he's the priest, they take the ark to battle with the plishtim at a place called Evan Ezer, also known as Izbet Sarta. For those of you familiar with Israel, it's where roads number five and six meet. And there they go into battle, and the Ark of the Covenant, the, the, the tabernacle, it is lost to the Philistines. And in what turns out is a marathon, because it's exactly 26 miles, a Benjaminite runner comes to here, tells Eli the Kohen that the battle has been lost, that his two sons, Chofni and Pinchas, have been killed, and that the Ark of the Covenant has been taken by the Plishtim, and Eli dies. Now, we know from the archaeology that, even though the Tanakh doesn't say it, that the Plishtim come here after that, and they destroy Shiloh. And that, how do we know this from the archaeology? Because in the, we have found here in the 1970s, 1980s, there were digs that were done here, and they found burnt almonds and raisins. Raisins, of course, are grapes. And the date to minus 1050, and that is what we think is what happens here. And then Shiloh goes off the map. Shiloh is destroyed, it is off the map. So when your Miyahu uses this place in the destruction of Shiloh, Everybody goes nuts, all right? They all know what happened here and that a former Beit Hashem, all right, the Mishkan where Hashem dwells has already been destroyed. And so if that's what Yirmiyahu was threatening them with, that this is what's gonna happen to the first temple, they understand that and they get extremely upset with him. Almonds on the almond tree. Maybe the descendants of the almonds that were here 3,000 years ago. 
So the, the Judeans know that Shiloh and, of course, the Mishkan had been destroyed 400 years before. There's an interesting question, though. Was Shiloh ever rebuilt? So we have some tantalizing clues, both in the Tanakh and without. One of them is this rock over here, which is part of a four-horned altar. All right, so the people at some point didn't want to go to Yerushalayim. And that's part of what Yirmiyahu was ex is ups getting upset with them about. They're not coming to Yerushalayim. They're not behaving well. People have their own little altars and sometimes worshiping other gods, even in Yerushalayim. There are two reforms during reformations, during the first temple period, one by Chizkiyahu, one by Yoshiyahu, where they break the bamot, where they break the, the altars to pagan gods. And what we feel is that this over here, this rock, which was later on used in a building, is evidence of one of those reformations. The altar was broken. It's not going to be used for ritual purposes anymore. But hey, it's still a nicely cut rock. And so they use it inside one of the walls. So this is a very, very interesting little clue as to what went on here. Another clue that we have is from the Tanakh itself. After Shlo During Shlomo's reign, he has everybody build the Beit HaMikdash, and then he asks everybody to build the palaces for all his wives. And Yerovam, the son of Nevat, and I'm reading to you here from Malachim Aleph, Yud Aleph, Malachim 1, uh, chapter 11. Yerovam, the son of Nevat, an Ephraimite, that's also important because we are here in the Nachala of Ephraim. Joshua was also from the tribe of Ephraim, meaning from Yosef, from Rachel, and from Yosef. He... He, during that time, Yeravam went out of Jerusalem and the prophet Achiah of Shiloh met him on the way. Yeravam is upset with Shlomo HaMelech and he doesn't know if they should be conscripted to build the palaces of the queens. And Achiah tells him no. He says Shlomo is wrong and you don't have to do that. So Yeravam starts a rebellion. Shlomo HaMelech doesn't like it very much and he ends up running away to Mitzrayim, to Egypt, and not coming back until after Shlomo HaMelech is dead and ends up breaking away the kingdom. He becomes the king of this area with the 10 tribes and Jerusalem is Judea and this is Israel. So there's a beautiful message in here as well. With the kings, when the leaders take advantage of the people, look what you can end up with, okay? That, that kind of break, that tremendously terrible break right after Shlomo HaMelech. The Beit HaMikdash has barely stood for a few decades, and already you have people who are not going to Jerusalem, and instead they're up in this area, and you have Israel and Judah and two separate kingdoms, and sometimes they're even warring with each other. Tribes, brothers warring with each other. All right, we're coming into this, what many historians and archaeologists feel is the southern entrance into the town of Shiloh. You're always looking for the gate whenever you go into a town because the gates in the olden days weren't just the way you got in, but it was really the administrative center. It told you how people worshipped and who they worshipped and where business went on. Think of the stories, let's say, of Boaz going in order to be able to marry Ruth, Avraham Avinu going to find the owner, right, of Marada Machpelah and being able to buy the field. This all happened at the gates of the city. So here they're looking for the gates, and in the meantime, they have found some remnants from the Roman period and the Byzantine period. So we know that people were living here then. All right, so we're talking about the end of the Second Temple period. So people did come back to Shiloh. It didn't remain destroyed. The Kedusha, however, left for good. Once the Mishkan was destroyed, the Kedusha never came back here. And many years later, when it rests once again in Yerushalayim, and for us, Yerushalayim is Hamakom. Okay, once you have the first Beit HaMikdash, even though it was destroyed, and then later on the second Beit HaMikdash, for us, as we all know, and that's what we're doing today, commemorating the destructions of the Temple and all the other catastrophes that have happened to the Jews on the 9th of Av, it's, we think about Yerushalayim and the destruction of Beit HaMikdash. But before Yerushalayim, this was the place. This was the place where people came to. This is where Elkanah comes to with Chana, with Pnina. This is where Shmuel Hanavi works in the Mishkan with Eli, the, the prophet who anoints the first kings, both Shaul from the tribe of Binyamin, and later on David from the tribe of Yehuda. So you see also 
this kind of rivalry to a great extent between the children of Rachel, Benjamin, of course, one of the sons of Rachel, and the children of Leah, right? That kind of tension, that kind of rivalry. One of the most tragic and I would say even appalling stories of the Tanakh is Pilegish Bagiv'ah. At the end of the book of Judges, when Shiloh is the heart of religious life, there is a terrible story of, of Pilegish Bagiv'ah, of the concubine, who is apparently killed by Benjaminites. And as a result, the other tribes fight and almost destroy the tribe of Benjamin. What does this have to do with Shiloh? The tribe of Benjamin is brought back. I mentioned that this is where Joshua divides the land. This is where there's also a chdut among the brothers. Even in the places where bad things happened, there can be a tikkun and the good things can come out of that. And so when the Benjaminites are brought back and need to look now for wives because the women and children are also killed, it is in the vineyards around Shiloh that the Benjaminites go and there's no shiduchim, maybe it's the first time without shiduchim, and they catch their wives, the girls are in the vineyards, and they are allowed to marry the Benjaminites, and that's how the tribe of Benjamin is able to reconstitute itself so that the first king, of course, Shaul, can be from Benjamin. So this area is also a symbol of that kind of love, and that's why you have, you had a fourth festival in those days, a festival that is no longer, wasn't, celebrated for a long time, but now is once again being celebrated. And that's Tuba Av. That's the 15th of Av. And there's many reasons for Tuba Av being a joyous day. One of them actually comes from the time in the desert where it was every ninth of Av, every Tisha B'Av, that the people would dig their own graves. Because remember, the generation that left Egypt is not going to be allowed to come into the land. So as our sources say it, People would dig their own graves. They would lie in there on the 9th of Av, and the people who were gonna die that year would not get up in the morning. But on the last year, the people dug the graves. They got up the next day, and on the 10th, and on the 11th, and on the 12th. And then it was on the 15th of Av when they realized that we were done. We were gonna be going into the land, and whoever was still alive was going to be privileged to go into the land. So the 15th of Av became a day of joy, and for many other reasons as well, and girls would come and dance in the vineyards, which is something that's happening again. If you're here in Israel on the 15th of Av, there's a whole festival for women. Women come here. There are shirim, there's dancing just for women. Thousands of women come here. But in the, those days, this was the fourth festival where people would make a pilgrimage to the Mishkan and to this area because it was the height of the grape harvest. And so this was the wine festival and you can see the connection to love and to marriage there also, right? Everyone's squishing the grapes, getting a little tipsy maybe, all right? And this was a very big festival and what is sets up the understanding that Shiloh and the Mishkan are going to be destroyed is something very, very interesting from the end of the book of Judges. In the end of the book of Judges, it says this, the annual feast of the Lord is now being held in Shiloh. And they were talking about Tuba Av. And then the Torah said, the Tanakh says, it lies north of Beit El, east of the highway that runs from Beit El to Shechem, and south of Livona. They're giving directions to Shiloh. Now, nowhere does it ever give directions to Yerushalayim or to almost any place because obviously the people knew where it was. If they have to give directions at the end of the book of Judges to Shiloh, then it tells us reading between the lines that the people weren't coming here, that the people stopped coming. Either they were doing their own altars to pagan gods. They weren't coming here and apparently because the priests didn't behave to them nicely. And so nobody wanted to come, which is a very powerful message as well, that religious leaders, if they don't behave properly, will turn people away from the religion of all types. There's a huge responsibility. And so it is such a, a sad little sentence here that, tell, that speaks volumes 
about how rarely people were coming up to Shiloh. And really, perhaps then, before it was even destroyed, it had lost its centrality to the people. And we're, what Yirmiyahu is saying to the Jews in Jerusalem, and I'll read you here from Jeremiah, from Jeremiah 7, is essentially the same thing, that it's just a place if you're not behaving properly, okay? Um, don't put your trust in illusions and say, I'm reading here from chapter 7 in Jeremiah, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these buildings. No, if you really mend your ways and your actions, if you execute justice between one man and another, if you do not oppress the stranger, the orphan, the widow, if you do not shed the blood of the innocent in this place, if you do not follow other gods to your own hurt, then then only will I let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers for all time. See, you are relying on illusions that are of no avail. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and sacrifice to Baal? Right? The three major sins that the Rabbanim, that the sages say, the first temple was destroyed because the three major sins of morality, Shvichut Amim, Gilu Arayot, and Avodah Zarah. This is what Yirmiyahu is laying out here. Jeremiah is warning them, if you do not, if you behave like this, then the Beit HaMikdash will be destroyed. And to be here in Shiloh and to talk about the destruction of the Mishkan here in Shiloh harks in on that same theme. And that's why it is such a powerful imagery for your meow to be giving to the people because they all know what happened here. And when he makes that connection, they get very upset. But what do they do? They get upset with your Miyahu. They don't listen to the message. They take it out on the messenger. And this also tells you something about the reign of Yehoiakim, who at the time is the king. He wasn't allowing free speech anymore. So much of the Tanakh leans into what we do today. It's like history repeats itself. So much of the beauty of the Tanakh is the messages that it gives us that are relevant for our lives today. Up until then, the Judeans, it was free speech. You might not like what someone had to say. The different, for example, Micha and other prophets who also were saying things that were tough to hear. But not only were they saying them, it was written down. People were allowed to say what they wanted to say. You could listen or not listen. But what's happening here, and this is what's so frightening in this chapter with, with Yirmiyahu, and it's also in uh, Kafvav in chapter 26, which is probably a continuation of the same scene that's happening here. Yirmiyahu not necessarily written in chronological order, is that he's being shut down. They're not listening to what he's saying and they don't want to hear it. And that is something that's very frightening and very relevant to us today. This is a beautiful little museum just showing some of the finds that they have here in Shiloh. It's been dug on and off for over 40 years. There are three archaeologists working here now. So you can understand how powerful the cultures around were, the, the pull to polytheism, to worshiping other gods, not just Hashem. And they failed. The first temple period, the, the Bay first Bet HaMikdash ends up being destroyed. And then we get back into our land and we rebuild and there's Jews living here again. We had pottery showing that from what's called the second temple period, all right? Also called the Roman period, because the Romans come in at some point. We have coins here from the Hashmonaim, so that we know the Jews were here. And why is the second Bet HaMikdash destroyed? Uh, something we also commemorate on Tisha B'Av. Now it's because of Sinat Chinam. It's not because of the sins of morality, it's because we're not getting along with each other, because of baseless hatred among the Jews. Just pull all these messages together. We don't have Yirmiyahu today, we don't have a Navi today, but we have his words. And what can we take from his words that still apply to us today, and that we can be Zoche this time for rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash and turning Tisha B'Av into a day of joy and a day of gladness, and not a day of fasting and a day of grief and even the weeks leading up to it, as we have had for so many thousands of years. So here's some of the finds from the different time periods and the jugs that we found burnt raisins and burnt almonds in, um, showing the destruction of Shiloh by the Plishtim, okay? And the Mishkan is gone and the Mishkan never comes back. This place, is, place loses its importance as a religious center. It doesn't lose its importance in other ways, 
but it loses its importance to religious center. It goes to Yerushalayim. And then, even after the first Chorban, and Yirmiyahu survives and goes to Mitzrayim with the people, so everybody runs to Egypt because they're going in the opposite direction of Babylon, so they're going to be running south because the Babylonians come from the north. Jeremiah goes with them. They actually establish some kind of Beit HaMikdash in Egypt, in the Nile. And it's later on destroyed, but it is with Ezra later on, at the beginning of the Second Temple period, that it is established Yerushalayim as Hamakom. Yerushalayim from now on is the place. And that even when the temples are destroyed, the Second Temple later, a few hundred years later being destroyed, it will still be the place. And we know that. We have never stopped yearning for Yerushalayim, praying towards Yerushalayim every time you pray. Three times a day you're praying towards Yerushalayim. Pesach Seder L'Shana Habab Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, the city reestablished with Jewish life, but also, please God, the third Beit HaMikdash to one day be rebuilt. We should be privileged to rebuild it. Well, that will never, ever be destroyed. We found a mikvah here from the Second Temple period. Mikvah definitely means that the Jews were here. We're the only ones who do mikvah. So this is a kosher mikvah from <coughs> Bayit Sheni, showing that the Jews were living here during that time period. Underneath here, we have all kinds of caves and underground passages. The Jews also hid here from the Romans during the Bar Kokhba revolt. But I want you to take a look as we're walking up this ramp to this beautiful audiovisual that was put here a few years ago to really illuminate the story of Hanan, of Shmuel, and of her coming despite of the fact that a lot of people, especially women, aren't coming to the Mishkan. Chana is still coming. She's praying to Hashem for a child. The idea of tefillah for the Rabbanim, for the Chachamim, is taken from tefillah Chana. It's seen as the paradigm of prayer. That also, you could say that tefillah is born here in Shiloh. But if you take a look around, and now behind me, we're looking out to the west, and you can see the vineyards that have once again been replanted in Shiloh. Reading to you here from Yirmiyahu, Lamed Aleph, after all his warnings and his, what's eating away at him is his knowledge that we're not going to repent. And the first Beit HaMikdash is going to be destroyed and so many people will die and go into exile. But what he says here in Lamed Aleph is this. Therefore, I continue my grace to you. I will build you firmly again, O maiden Israel. Again, you shall take up your timbrels and go forth to the rhythm of the dancers. That's why it's so beautiful here when the women dance here on Tuba'av. Again, you shall plant vineyards in the hills of Samaria. Men shall plant and live to enjoy them. It's not just enough to plant, but what if your enemies come and kill you and then they take like a double burden, a double blow, is that they take what you have planted. But men shall plant and live to enjoy them, for the day is coming when watchmen shall proclaim on the heights of Ephraim, come, let us go up to Zion, Zion meaning Yerushalayim, to the Lord our God. So we're actually seeing this nevoah come true in Shiloh, with all the sadness and the tragedy of Tisha B'Av. And what ends up happening on Tisha B'Av, that we still grieve for until today, you can come out here to Shiloh, to the heart of what was Nachalat Ephraim. And you can look and you can see the vineyards in bloom and you can drink the wine that's coming from these vineyards. And the men and the women who are planting these vineyards are once more enjoying literally the fruit of their labors. And you, you can see also by the topography how similar this is to Jerusalem. We just walked up and we are on the top of what most archaeologists not all feel was the town of Shiloh. And we're looking to the north and we're seeing a long rectangular area that in its dimensions is the dimensions of the Mishkan, 25 by 50 amma, uh, on an east-west axis, just like the Beit Hamikdash was, the entry to the east, Kodesh HaKodashim, to the west. And north of the city, not the old city of Yerushalayim, don't be confused, but I'm talking about Ir David, Ir David going like this and on an east-west axis above it, Aliyah, is where the Beit HaMikdash was. And the not being the tallest hill, Har HaMoriah is not the tallest hill in Jerusalem. So just like Yerushalayim, 
this, this area is the same, where it's a small hill surrounded by larger hills. So, for example, if we were in Yerushalayim, we would be looking now on Har Tzofim, and then to the east, to Har Zetim, and over to the west, to the southwest, we've got Har Tzion. So it's that same topographical element. We don't have to go to the physical high places to build the Beit HaMikdash and to worship Hashem. That's not what we're about, the physical high places. Connecting to Hashem is not about that. And Shiloh is very similar to Yerushalayim in that way, with a valley all the, all the way around it as well that protected it in the olden days. We've got the walls here that protected the city of Shiloh as well. And here we have the modern town of Shiloh behind us, a few hundred families once again living in Shiloh. So you see the nevuot that are coming true. And what is so beautiful about Yirmiyahu is when he's telling them that life here will stop, the example is that he uses is that there will be no more weddings. The sounds of gladness of the, of the bride and groom will not be heard anymore. Not being able to establish a family, not being able to get married is the ultimate sign because Judaism is all about family. That's a message that Tanakh gives us over and over and over again. It's about the core elements of the family. And one, but what he says also is in his nivuot of when the good times happen again is, how will we know when things are right again and when Hashem is happy with us again? Once again in the hills outside Jerusalem, once again in Jerusalem itself, we will be hearing the voices, the singing of gladness of the bride and of the groom. After Tisha B'Av is over, we will hopefully have weddings again. It's been a difficult time now for so many of us around the world that weddings have had to be postponed because of this terrible pandemic. Blessing everyone here from the hills of Shiloh, from a place where the Mishkan once was, where Hashem's presence was initially with us as an Am in the land, wishing all of us achdut, togetherness as the Jewish people, and, and togetherness as a nation, as a people, and also as couples, that we will once again be able to have large weddings and people come and make the bride and groom joyous. That's also part of what's inherent here in Shiloh when it comes to Tuba Av and the weddings of Binyamin. Our history reflects our present, reflects our future. And in this place, yes, there was the disruption and the breaking apart, but there was also the achdut, the bringing together. And it's up to us to be able to do that, to be able to fix what is wrong. Hashem never loses faith in us, as long as we don't lose faith in Him and make sure that our behavior reflects the stature and the greatness in which He has blessed us with this Tanakh and to live by its teachings. <laughs> Yeah.